Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to uh, Dumb SEO Questions, uh, episode 402. Each week we meet here to uh, um, review and um, add to the questions asked on the Dumb SEO Questions Facebook group. Um, with us tonight we have uh, Richard Hearn. Richard uh, is uh, an upper echelon SEO uh, from, um, he's based in uh, Thailand and uh, also uh, um, you can find red, at redcardinal.ie if he's uh, done any work on that website. Hasn't I? I've got a lot of, a lot of websites like that. <laughs> And uh, Masataki Wasa, he's webmaster of wasaweb.net. Uh, he's a um, Google product expert on the uh, AdWords, um, sorry, AdSense community. Uh, he's based in Wimbledon, um, uh, a suburb of London. All right. Um, we are expecting others to join us, um, but... Uh, I, I have a few technical issues, and while things are going well, let's uh, record this one. Um, our first, um, our first uh, question is. Um, yeah, let me see. Did I click the right button then? Well, we'll see. All right. Um, this one is titled. Uh, a question about redirects and 410 status codes. It's uh, from Sean Clark. Uh, he said, let's say we have a product and it gets indexed and, and then we change the URL and add a 301 redirect to point to the new URL. And then we notice the original URL is listed in Search Console as excluded because of the redirect. However, when we search Google, we find the new URL is indexed. Um, should um, should we change the 301 redirect and replace it with a, a 410? Uh, um, he said uh, a 410. Okay, R redirect, but it's it's a it's it's a 410 gone um, code um, to tell Google that the old URL is gone. Or should we do something else? Uh, um, uh, thanks for your advice. And thank you for your question, Sean. The answer is no. And if he'd like to do a 410, he can. Will it be better to leave the 301? In nearly every case I can think of in my head, it is better to leave the 301 than to use a 410 there. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think one thing that um, that was worrying them is the fact that the, the, the old... URLs appear as excluded, but that's as intended, and that's not something you should be worried about. Thank you, Mr. Taki. Thank you, Richard. Let's roll on to number two on our run list. Um, Michat Makalis uh, APK uh, has a question titled, should I use href lang for a multinational site over TLDs? Um, Michaela said, hi, everyone. Do you know if someone has to use uh, uh, Lang for a multinational site over TLDs? The site operates mainly uh, on a site example.co.uk, and its online presence was expanded um, on example.de. Um, and example.es, Germany and Spain. Um, each site is written in a different language accordingly. Uh, for instance, uh, only uh, um, English for UK, only Spanish for ES, etc. And note that the content and layout is the same across all different TLDS sites and rankings for core keywords are in one to three positions. Uh, thanks in advance. I see, Richard, you've made a start on this one already. Yeah, quite a while ago. Um, there's one thing I noticed, and I, I you know, generally, um, 
I, I normally find myself in agreement with some of most of the other well-known SEOs, but like people se seem to mix up what hreflang does and what, what its purpose is. And hreflang is related to language. It's not related to, to location per se, although there is a location parameter in there. Um, but the location parameter isn't based on where people really are. It's what they're saying, what their browser tells Google they'd like to see. And yeah, people tend to get this mixed up. Like in this case, there is zero downside to this guy adding hreflang. And there is actually potentially the upside of him getting people who speak the right language onto the right site. And it's especially the case when you've got multiple English language sites. So like I work with clients where they'll have an English language site. Let's just say, for example, they would have obviously a mayor US, they'd have UK. Very often they'll have an EU, which isn't a country per se, but it's a, it's a region. And that, they'll all be English and they'll all be the same content. And it makes perfect sense to put hreflang on those because very often when hreflang is broken, I go to google.co.uk and a UK IP address and I'll get an EU site coming back to me, even though there is a UK site because I know I work on these sites, so I know it's there. Um, the reason it's broken is because it's quite difficult to set up hreflang a lot. So... Um, I don't see any downside if he can do it. It's very tricky to implement. It's expensive. It takes time. It's very brittle. It breaks very easily. But if he figures out how to do it, he knows how to do it, he should. I don't see any downside. So, you know, I just see that the comment there that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But, well, how do you know if it's broke or not? That's, that's the underlying question. You're not going to get those stats. You're not, no one's looking in their browser or in their analytics to see are my NUK users seeing my NEU site? That just rarely happens. Very rare that people will slice and dice by the language parameters that the browser is sending to, to Google search results. So, um, yeah, personally, I just think it's worth doing. Um, even in this case with CCTLD, it, it'll work with CCTLD just as well as, it, as anything, any other TLD. So, yeah, that's, that's what I've written there, and that's, that's what I think. Perfect, Richard. Yes, um, Mr. Taki, did you want to add anything to that? No, I totally agree with Richard. Excellent. There we are. <laughs> all right, number three on our run list. It's uh, Nick Dawes asking a question titled, Quick Question for the Wise. Um, Nick said, hey, folks, uh, a quick question for the wise. I'm paying for advertising on a, a popular, relevant website on a per-click basis. This has driven some traffic my way uh, over the past uh, six weeks, which is great. Um, but I'd like to ask a question regarding this type of advertising. I'm invoiced according to reports pulled from Google Analytics. Uh, wouldn't it be technically uh, uh, very straightforward to automatically artificially generate site hits for the benefit of an advertiser in this situation? Is there anything in place within Google Analytics to determine uh, genuine site hits versus bots or other fake traffic? For the uh, record, I have no reason to suspect anything like this is happening. I'm, I'm very happy with the advertiser. Um, love and respect to all. Uh, he said, I'm asking purely out of curiosity as uh, an SEO uh, marketing newbie. Thanks. Well, Massa, any ideas, any thoughts on this one? It's an interesting one. It's not pure SEO, so. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to rely on Google Analytics for these kinds of data um, because in theory and in practice, it is not difficult to manipulate those figures. Yeah. Yeah, it, well, the, the, um, Google Analytics was never intended to, to be, um, um, the, the, it's, it's, it's only a representative sample of uh, the the traffic recorded anyway. It, it's, it's, I mean, the 360 product obviously isn't, isn't, you know, doesn't, isn't sampling. So, I mean, there is the possibility that it's been tracked in 360, but we don't know. I mean, it's not clear. Um, I mean, look, it, 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 
I'm sure there's plenty of sites that do this, you know, that do bill out based on the clicks they see in Google Analytics. Like it's, I'm sure it's, this isn't exceptional. Um, and I suppose really, you know, all the comments in there, it says, if this person has reason to believe that there's fraudulent clicks, which there's going to be no matter what system he's using, there's going to be fraudulent clicks, like it goes on. But if they don't have a real reason to be concerned about this, if the traffic they're getting has value to them, and if the return on their their advertising budget is positive, well, you know, that's fine. But I mean, we don't know whether they're tracking their return and um, whether they're tracking their conversion rate from this traffic or even if they're if they're tracking conversion from this, this this traffic at all we don't know but i mean if they've no if they're happy enough with what they're getting well you know leave it be i mean it's a a judgment call on their part um but i just hope that they're they're trying to measure what they're getting back from this what the roi is on this spend and as I said, if it's if the ROI is decent and it's positive and it makes them additional books, well, you know, stick with it. Um, there might be an opportunity down the road for them to say to the the the, the publisher, well, we'd like to obviously have some other way to track the clicks. Um, but you know, GA is there; it's it's free probably, and yeah, I can understand why a publisher would want to do it that way, especially if they're a small publisher. You know, it's like I say, it's not uncommon, I'm sure. Excellent, uh, Richard. Thank you very much for that. All right, let's uh, go to number uh, four on our run list uh, from Demetrius, Demetrius Maddox. Um, he wants to know, is it safe to delete hidden pages? Uh, Demetrius said, I'm moving from Wix to WordPress. I have a bunch of hidden pages on the old Wix site that are not on the site map and that I no longer need. Is it safe to delete these pages and only focus on the pages that are on the sitemap and that are needed when moving the uh, WordPress? What exactly is meant by hidden? Uh, without knowing that, I th it's, it's a bit difficult. Um, but if you don't need those pages any longer, um, make sure it returns a 404. Yeah, the definition of hidden would be very different to different people, I think. Uh, are they accessible publicly or are they, that's what they really have to define, like are these pages that are not published or are they pages that are accessible publicly but aren't linked to within the internal nav? Um, you know, really they'd have to define what they are, but chances are if they're hidden in some way, they weren't important to the, to the website as it was when it was on Wix, and therefore they're probably not going to be important to the website when it's on WordPress. But there is always an edge case there. If they were published, there could have been some value in them because they could have been passing through some sort of link equity. Who knows? So they'd really need to define whether this whether hidden means unpublished or hidden means published and not easily accessed. That's different things. I would say it's probably 90. 97 98 percent safe to assume that they have no value but there's always going to be those edge cases where hidden actually isn't really hidden and this person just isn't familiar with you know how websites can work sometimes so just need to take care of that that's all excellent thank you richard all right uh, let's look at number five on our run list from d la in Gomasi, and uh, he's asked a question that's titled, I republished my article in full. Um, he said, I do a ton of outreads for link building and it works amazingly well. However, I've, I've gotten two links where the respondent just republishes my article in full and leaves all the internal links, brackets pointing to my site. Um, he said, will this have any negative impact on my site at all? He said, I'm not paying for the link and it's just an exchange to benefit their readership. That's the question. What do we have for DLA, guys? I see Michael Martinez said, uh, you should be fine. I wouldn't worry about it. He's dead right, I think, you know. Again, 
it's going to be one of these things where it'll be, if anything is a problem, it's an edge case. And, you know, generally speaking, this guy doesn't need to worry about it. Michael Martinez is spot on. Yeah. All right. So let's go to number six in the run list. We're halfway through. Um, Kunjil Chorwin uh, asked the question titled Page Jump Links in the Main Header Navigation Menu. Kunjil said, uh, is it a good practice to uh, link page jump links uh, in the main header navigation menu? He said, I mean, Lighthouse SEO recommendations explicitly uh, highlights the message as uncrawlable links. Um, so considering that, um, would it be a good practice uh, to link? This... I was trying to figure out what this was, okay? And the first thing is the main header navigation normally contains links to pages on the site. That's what people normally expect to find in the main nav. Um, I don't think it would be normal practice to put <laughs> links, which are internal links on the page where you're on within the main nav. They would expect it, people would probably expect them to be somewhere else. But I was trying to figure out what the message was that he's getting from lighthouse and i know what the what it is it's i would say that his jump links are using hash fragments relative earls they're using relative links which the browser can handle and but which light lighthouse is picking up as a broken link of some description and i'd say it's just a it's more like a reporting error in lighthouse like i don't think th those jump links would have zero impact on his performance and um, what it is, is I think that Lighthouse is picking them up and thinking that he's linking to a resource which it can't crawl. And I, 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 my guess is that that's what it is. It's an edge case and it's actually a reporting error in Lighthouse that he doesn't have any such links in his site. Um, there's no way that a, an anchor, an A href anchor, would have any performance implication for a website. So there's something else going on here that's not clear in terms of what he's what he's telling or what he's reporting or what Lighthouse is reporting to him. Um, I don't think there's any, there's no performance benefit or hit from having jump links in your page, really. It's, it will be imperceptible. So whatever he thinks is good for users, he should do. But just be careful that he's not interpreting a Lighthouse error or alert that is actually a reporting error within Lighthouse. It's not a real issue. I think that's my best guess. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you also to Michael Martinez uh, for his uh, contribution. Okay, let's move to uh, number seven on our run list. We're more than halfway through. Uh, Tamsin Jantz Van Vuren asked the question titled, How often should I re regenerate the XML sitemap? Uh, Tamsin said, hi, everyone. Please, uh, may I ask, uh, every time you load new content uh, slash URLs to a website, uh, do you need to regenerate the XML sitemap and then submit that to uh, Google Search Console? I'm waiting for Massa. <laughs> Oh, um, um, so assume that Tamsin's uh, generating the sitemap manually here. I think, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's not done automatically because sometimes, depending on platforms that you use, they're generated automatically. So you wouldn't have to worry about that. Um, I think, I mean, if you, the reason why, I have XML sitemaps is to see um, which pages are indexed or not indexed. And that's when, you know, because you can click through at the um, sitemap level to see how many of the um, URLs there are um, indexed or not. So I use that for that purpose, not really for discovery because yeah. Search engines are usually good at discovering new content so long as you are linking to them from your homepage or other um, frequented pages. 
so I wouldn't have I wouldn't necessarily submit the sitemap every time you upload something to Google Search Console. I don't think that's necessary. Um, if you have a sitemap and if you have if you um, set the location to, to the sitemap on your robots txt, then the chances are that they are crawled quite frequently. Um, Curiously, the, the 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 feature you mentioned initially about you know using the sitemaps um, as an indicator or, or as a way to filter within Search Console, it's a very underknown uh, tactic. You know, it's it's actually it's a very clever tactic that most people they you never you don't really hear about pe people talk about like you know using their sitemaps in that way. I mean, there's other there's other fair, fairly cute people who also use sitemaps to do testing SEO testing. By by creating different buckets and different sitemaps, so there's all these other sort of yeah, there there are a little bit edge case uses for sitemaps, but I think that one that you mentioned, Mass, is very interesting. That a lot of people don't think to use it as a way to figure out what is Google indexing or not indexing, which is generally more important. And um, the one counter I'd give to the you know why I think it's a good idea to to have a sitemap regenerated and resubmit it anytime content is updated is that if you want to get the quickest response, and if you've got a high velocity site, so if you've got a news website and you're publishing like four or 500 articles a day, um, a sitemap is gonna be sort of really important to you because, okay, Google is picking up your sitemaps on their own, but if you're updating content, what you want, really wanna do is you wanna regenerate your XML sitemap pretty much instantly and submit it. You want that all to be automated. You don't want to be doing it manually. But once you do that, you will get the crawl. You will get a crawler coming into your updated URLs almost instantly. And for some sites, speed matters. And you know the freshness and the quick, the, you know, how quick you get your content in there, especially for things like Google News, it's going to have an impact. You know, it's going to generate traffic. So there are some cases where you know where I agree completely with Masataki, and then there's some cases I think there are benefits there to doing it. So it, it varies from site to site, but I would definitely tell like if you have a high velocity site, if it's not automatically, automatically generating your XML sitemaps and pinging Google with them, like you don't want to be doing this manually. You want to automate that process. It you know it, it's not worth your time and effort to be doing it. But it's well worth doing it in an automated fashion, and definitely, I would say, yeah, you know, update sitemaps whenever there's a modification to a, any page or a new page is added. You know, you you create a new page in the sitemap, or you update the last mod date to now, and the like. Googlebot will be in there, depending on your site. But if you've got a big site, it'll be in there like instantly. Instantly, it'll be in there. So it's well worth it if you have a high velocity site. Um, if you've got a smaller site that's only been updated, you know, once every blue moon, yeah, it's not going to make as much difference. It really depends on the site. Thank you. Yeah. Rich. And you know, if you can automatically generate sitemap, I would also generate um, RSS feed as well because they tend to get discovered really pretty rapidly too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And they're also used for things like Google Publisher, Publisher Center. You know, there's various other uses for for RSS feeds. Like, it, it, in my view, the more ways you can you can communicate with search engines to explain and to help them to see that there's been a change, whether that be a modification or an addition or even a removal. You can also use sitemaps for for remove content. If you wanted them to see the remove content, you can you can load up a sitemap with URLs that are 410. And they'll be crawled more quickly, also. So there's multiple ways you can use sitemaps, and like the more information you can provide to search engines, the better. I mean, there's no downside unless it's incredibly costly for you to to do this, and it is if you're doing it manually, obviously. But once it's automated, like it's it's a no-brainer to me. It's and it's one of the it's one of the most underutilized SEO tactics, I think, is is XML sitemap optimization. And like there is, there's a whole field around it. As I said, there's people who use sitemaps for for SEO testing. You know, based on Google Search Console, they can they can book it. They can create two buckets within different sitemaps, and then slice and dice by those. And then you got things like people who use them for for content removal. 
I mean, you know, the, the, the most obvious thing that comes to my mind was like the debacle faced by Yoast. About a year ago, they updated Yoast SEO plugin for WordPress and they managed to turn on uh, attachment URLs for whatever, whatever million sites. And they had to put in a plugin which basically turned off attachment URLs and put out a 410 on the attachment URLs themselves and then built a, a removal sitemap. And it submitted that to Google, and Googlebot came in, and it's a, it looked at all these all these URLs with last mod de, mod mod date now, so it crawled them all. It saw the four tens much quicker, and they all dropped out much more quickly. So you had a great case study there where you could see the power of using sitemaps for for content removal. Um, and I'd say you know it's surprising that Yoast hasn't built or hasn't written some sort of content around that. Obviously, they don't want to draw attention to the negative side of what happened there, but. The positive side is that they probably got great, great case study data to show how quickly Google can remove content, which is 410, and also add it to an XML sitemap. So lots of uses there. Like XML sitemaps, I'm a big fan. OK, let's roll on to the next. It's number eight on our run list. Um, it's, it's, it's written in, um, I think it's Hebrew, is it? Um, he said, how do uh, people even know what uh, a PR, a page slash site has slash had? Um, he said, was PR available in the past? Well, yes, it was. But what was it? You know, I love that this guy is really, you know, he's he, he is just sort of drowning himself in SEO at the moment. Like, I, I love that in a positive way that he's just immersed in it. But the negative way is that he's sort of drowning in it as well, you know, is that he's he's sort of missing the trees for the woods, you know, because he's he's getting sort of bogged down in, in areas that, you know, I, I'm not surprised that he's picking up this stuff, but it's a shame that maybe he he's getting he's he's getting too deep and he's delving too deep into some of these areas of SEO that aren't going to benefit him. I mean, it might be interesting to learn some of this stuff, but at the end of the day, he's going to look back and he's going to sort of say to himself, "I wasted a hell of a lot of time on shit that doesn't matter, and is not going to make my site better." Um, I do understand how he's got here, but. I'd love to be able to sort of take him to the side and say, look, just don't worry about all this stuff right now. Try to make, you know, your site work really well to really meet the intents of your users. Uh, and then if you get it humming, then you can start to look at, you know, what can I tweak to make it better on a technical level? Um, but, you know, I, I do feel like, because he's asked a lot of questions in the last while, and I've tried to answer and I've tried to steer him clear stuff and say, you're not going to get any benefit from this, or you're not going to get any benefit from from whatever it might be. But he, it, it just, it's, it's sort of a shame that he, he is investing a lot of time and thought into areas that aren't really going to benefit him. And like, I really would, if I was he, I tried to focus on putting himself in the shoes of his users and try to sort of get out of the blinkered view of the publisher of the webmaster and try to think about what what's happening when users are coming to his site or how users should be finding his site what are they looking for what are they trying what are their problems and trying to make sure that he's actually you know he he's he's meeting those cu customer needs those user needs and then he can sort of get bogged down you know in some of the technical stuff that might give him a slight edge on competition and it can mount up don't get me wrong the technical seo can be valuable but it's just a shame that he's looking in the wrong places. Like this page rank, forget about. It's like him starting to focus on domain authority, and he's going to get in the wrong places too quickly. That's that's my opinion. I might be wrong, but that's what I think. In um, in defence of Damasio questions, though, I, he hasn't um, found those things on uh, no. On our YouTube channel or our... Uh, no, absolutely not. But, I mean, he is coming and he's asking about this stuff. So he's picking it up and it, it just sort of shows. I mean, it, it, if anything, actually, it shows that, like, it, for someone new to SEO, it, it, it probably isn't easy to 
to wander around the weeds like there's just so much out there and there's also a lot of snake oil out there and then there's a lot of just bad advice or not bad advice but there's probably a lot of old advice and like this is probably old stuff that he's picked up and like seo it moves so quickly and it really does if you think like for most of us who've been involved with it for a long time if you think about the changes that we've seen like, you know, 10 years is a long time in internet time. 20 years is, you know, I mean, it's generational nearly in internet time. And there's so much change, but like PR is something that like, if he had got involved with, with SEO 20 years ago, he'd be on the right path. But not now, not now, you know, it's, it's, it's a different ball game now. You know, you, 20 years ago, you, all you had to do was go out and find, you know, your PR8 website and get a link from it or a web page and get a link from it. It didn't have to be on the same topic or anything else. You could just rank. But, you know, SEO has changed so much from them that this isn't really valuable to him. He's, he's much better if he starts to think in terms of topics and entities and relatedness. You know, they're, they're the things that are, are going to have much more value than page rank. Like I, I'm, I'm completely of the view nowadays that like even some, if you, if, if page rank, if we could measure it now and you could go out and find a page rank, a page and get a link from it, if it's completely unrelated, I don't think that that's going to have a lot of value these days. It's not like 20 years ago where that link was valuable, no matter where it came from. Um, I think now that it's much more about, you know, how Google is understanding topics and entities, et cetera. And they're just going to look and they're going to sort of look at these pages and they're 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 just got too clever at, at at weeding stuff out you know at filtering out what what matters and what doesn't matter so yeah it, it's just it's 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 a shame to see it's great to see that he's he's inquisitive it's just it'd be lovely to see that he's more inquisitive about things like ux that would be far more valuable than getting into the weeds on stuff like page rank Ranto. User experience is what you meant, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. User experience, you know, that's far more valuable. Yeah. Um, Masataki. Well, what can I say? <laughs> um, I don't think there's much to add to what Richard said. Um, I think you have to work with the site you have and you know, with the figures and numbers and data that you have. Those are concrete things that you have. Um, work with principles and uh, pro and processes. Um, and you know, if you have a nice round figure, which is neat and simple, uh, the likelihood is that that's probably going to mislead um, them being helpful. You know, whether that's DA or PA or whatever. Um, so. I think it's always best to concentrate on the site you have and do what you can rather than, you know, trying to start from some sort of higher principle and trying to fit what you have into that, if that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Tati. Before we go on to the next, um, I uh, should point out Rob Watts uh, there with the first response. Uh, um, in our, our community there. Uh, Rob is an old school uh, SEO and um, that's when he's not running around in mud. Um, can, I add yeah. one, can I add a little bit of a disclaimer? Because just thinking about it a little bit more, I might be a little bit spoiled because like I do work with bigger sites and I do work with you know more established sites that, that can push around their weight so I might be a little bit spoiled to my view, and I'm sure for smaller sites, it's not, again, I'm not trying to backtrack. I'm not saying that page rank is something you should focus on. It probably is, has more use, that sort of, those sort of metrics have more use for smaller sites. And I am probably a little bit spoiled in that, like I work with sites that, that can rank well without worrying about links because their branding is so strong or whatever it is. So. I should add in that disclaimer, like that, that my the context of where I'm coming from is from large sites that are established and, and have very, very strong backlink profiles. They don't they're they're not link building is what I'm trying to say. So I can sort of understand that it's a bit unfair of me to say this is totally obscure or useless 
there's probably some use in this at some levels but but just not not page rank you know that's not the way to look at it like look for links if you are trying to build links you look for links from topical you know from you know topically similar sites and then of course you could start to use some of these metrics to try and say which links which which pages might be more beneficial than others if they're all on the same topic but yeah i i just want to yeah just say just to add a little bit of a disclaimer that it's probably a little bit unfair of me to to totally discount the idea of of link building and link metrics there's probably some value there That's what yeah i, I think the isn't there some sort of paradox in that you know a larger well-established site will have a more stable score as it were compared to a small site you know a small site can be influenced by um smaller things if that makes sense and mm -hmm. The, any numbers that tools give you are subject to sort of wide margin of error. Whereas for a well-established site, that margin that margin of error is necessarily smaller because mm. there's so much data, there is so much more confidence uh, mm. into the model that these um, tools give you. So there's a bit of paradox in there as well. So. <laughs> That's a good point. It is a good point. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. I mean, that, that's the fallacy of some of these tools also, especially ones that, that give you information about traffic and stuff like that. I mean, there's a complete paradox in there that they're just, they're guesstimates. They can be good for trending, but I would never rely on a lot of these tools for absolute, absolute, you know, levels. It's, they're, yeah. 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 So in a sense, it's good. That's sketchy and sketchy in the original sense of, well, not original, but in this meaning of it's very ambiguous and um, not, not in the sense of dodgy, but very um, approximate, if that makes sense. So, you know, as Richard said, it's good to, it's probably good at detecting trends. The larger, bigger picture, the bigger things happening, but if you run a small website, um, the sort of small details that the tools might spew up, mm, I wouldn't necessarily put too much weight on that. I worked, and I'm sorry to labor this, I know you want to move on, Jim, but I'm just going to mention that, like, you know, I work on large sites for the most part, but, but recently I helped a friend with a very small site. And I never work in gambling. He's in gambling, okay? And I just thought, but I'm surprised. The biggest thing, the, one of the biggest things that surprises me is actually the, the, the return you can get on UX work and on information architecture work. Like I just helped him with stuff like, let's focus on, you know, FAQ schema, how to's, um, on, on, on creating pages that were much better structured with, with better headings and jump links and, various things that were all UX related, just to see what the traffic was. Now, his traffic levels are tiny. They're very, still very small. Like, he's, you know, he's, we're talking maybe 5,000 people a month. We're not talking big traffic at all. But just from making some of these changes to templates, and, you know, just, just changes to the, the internal UX and the information architecture, he grew his traffic hugely, like, for, from what he was coming from. Now, it's, I'm, like I say, it's only small figures in, in absolute terms, but... You couldn't get those sort of same returns 10 years ago from Google by making those changes to your pages. You can now. And I think people underestimate what they can do on their own sites and the value they can get out of the changes they can make to their own content, even legacy content. You can refresh legacy content with better UX, better IA, and and you'll see returns on that. Like I think that's the, the areas that I, I try to say to people, like, look at that because you really can get a return there that those returns were not there, you know, in, in historical times when we were doing this 10 years ago, they weren't there, but they are now. And there's lots of ways you can start to focus, especially the rich stuff in Google SERPs. That's what I'd go for. If I was like a new guy, that's what I'd focus on. I'd learn about the schema stuff and the rich, the rich features and the SERP features. And that's what I'd focus on hundred percent. And if you can get those right, you know, generally speaking, your content is going to be really good for UX also. Most of the time, it's going to align pretty well. And you'll you'll see your traffic numbers go up without links, like no links, no, no links at all. That's 
that's the beauty of what I see nowadays that we didn't have 10 years ago or even probably nearly probably five years ago there was it was limited so yeah I think we've labored this one have we I I, I think we've covered it yeah do you right. reckon what, what our views are on page rank Is that what you're asking? You're asking what we've covered. I think he'll he'll probably be able to take away our 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 general answer to his 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 specific question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let, let let's move on to number nine on our run list. Uh, it's from Alyssa Janice, um, and it's uh, a question of. And besets us all, I guess. Uh, uh, how do they keep out ranking my website? Um, Alyssa went on to, to ask, he said, I have a client that just started his business last year. I, I recently built him a website. It, it was launched late December. You know, I've done basic SEO on the site at this point, and I'm about to start a, a full-on uh, SEO campaign strategy, search engine optimization. Um, the client has a competitor that is currently outranking him for most of his terms. This competitor has been in business longer than my client, um, but uh, does not have a website. My client keeps asking me why and how his competition with no website uh, is outranking him. I don't know what... Anyway. Yeah. How could domain age be a factor if he's got no website? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Pretty Tim isn't with us, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a GMB question. Yeah. Um, it, that becomes <laughs> up in later exchanges. Yeah, this is this is local results. You know, if he has no website, there's no other way that he's in Google unless it's a third party site like Yelp or something like that. But let's assume there's a mention of citations. I'm sorry for interrupting the question. Um, I mean, just domain age and time in business, uh, I don't think that they're big factors, to be honest. Um, domain age by itself, I think, is, I've, I would like to say I'm certain it's not a factor, but I would say it's a tiny factor. If it is any factor, it's more important. The reason why domain age is normally viewed as some sort of factor is because older domains generally, by their nature, have more links. But like you can have a 20 year old domain and I've got lots of 20 year old domains that have no links like and they're not going to have any SEO benefit. Like the fact that they're registered 20 years is going to make no difference. It's the links that are there to those old domains. And that's why domain age is sort of mixed up. It's not domain age. It's it's backlinks. Um, but this is local. Like it's probably like it. it, it I would suggest that this person um, open a map. Uh, it's probably related to a locality. Um, get the center point of that locality and then map where the competitor's address is and where your client's address are because that's one of the factors that's going to be part of of local local ranking is going to be proximity and then yeah have a look for the citations see, see what what comes up <gasps> we've just been joined by david resin that david lives on the, the, the sunny south of uh, the UK, West Sussex. Indeed. I see, I see your mate Harry is going back to uh, the, the UK. Um, is he? The Earl of Sussex. <laughs> well, it's, it's all very weird around here in, in the UK with the Duke of Sussex and whatever. Uh, the, the local... Um, uh, the 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 local duke is the Duke of Norfolk, who lives up in the uh, up the road in Arundel, for some reason. Uh, so all the roads around there's lots of Norfolk roads and Norfolk places and stuff here in West Sussex. So work that out if you want to go into your English history. Okay, um, but uh, if. Um... Yes, that and David. Oh, look who this is. Oh, has our expert turned up? Turned up. The Kappa. Ah, the oh. GMB expert. The, 
the right person. We thought you were dead. <laughs> close, close to it, mate. Close to it. Go on, give us a smile. <laughs> Tim, we're on question nine, which is a um, GMB question. Oh, Christ. How oh. many times? Ah, uh, um... Okay, so GMB and regular search, two different things, two different algos. Uh, GMB um, is is relevance, prominence, and, and 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 distance. Those are the kind of three main sort of things. Um, in terms of prominence, this one said it's been around for a while, I believe, in one of the questions. The, the com competitors business so uh, it probably has mentions of it it probably has built up natural citations over the years um, in the old days um, you know uh, directories used to go out when they first started to go and find uh, companies to list or businesses to list so they probably built up naturally o over time um, so your first thing to look at um, Alyssa would be to go and uh, get yourself into some relevant local uh, directories. Um, look if there are any also um, niche ones. So, for example, if it's a dentist, go out and find dentist focused ones uh, after you've done some uh, local citations. Uh, distance, that's a tricky one because you can't really control where your clients opened up his business um if he's on the outskirts of a city and people are searching inside of a city you can't really massively influence that um yeah so you know those are those kind of things you 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 can look at what 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 do you think she should like? I mean, if she's gonna, she mentions she's gonna start a, a full on SEO campaign. What what should she do? What would you do if you were in that position? And okay, to... so my first yeah, so my first ten, my, first, my well not ten, my first my first things would be to optimize your site for local. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, if um, so, if it's a dentist, for example. Your title tag would be, you know, the name of the business hyphen. Um, if you're a dental clinic, dental clinic in. Um, or if you are a dentist that specializes in a particular type, like um, orthodontal, so orthodontist in. Um, and optimize on page for that. Um, have your uh, next thing I would check is make sure you've got your uh, your business address um, in the footer, you know, um, or depending on the site, it could be having running down the side, but at least have it on 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 page running across site. So hence the footer. Um, I would also put a link into sort of you know underneath that it would be address uh, find us and with a little and, and embed your CID from your GMB onto that so you know and obviously open up a new new window so you don't lose the customer uh, or user when they've clicked through to that um, then if you have any specific niche services so let's say you're a clinic um, or even an orthodontist but uh, you know you sp specify services it would be let's say teeth whitening so I know, you know, in the actual title of that page, it would be, um, you know, um, express teeth whitening in location hyphen the name of the clinic or the name of the orthodontist. Um, this sounds, you know, it, it, it's, it, it really works in terms of local and you, you've really got to focus on that, that the local aspect of it. Um, then citations so go out and i'm not going to go and say you know some places will offer you oh 999 freaking citations 
you don't just go and find sort of the, you know, the depending on where you are, if you're in the States, there's a, you know, sort of a top, a top 20 list of aggregators. The aggregators then aggregate out to the others. So just get yourself into them, those top 20. Um, if you're in other countries, just find out what the, 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 the most prominent ones are. Uh, then after those, go and find niche ones. So if you're a dentist, go and get yourself into the dentist one, dental ones. If you're a plumber, go and get yourself into the plumbing ones. Um, then you should start seeing things uh, shape up a bit more in terms of uh, where you should be positioning yourself locally. You've got a bit of a hard on for dentists at the moment, don't you? <laughs> I should be chiropractors for some reason. Chiropractors are, are knocking on my door all day long. I don't know what is going on. Okay. <laughs> There's obviously something afoot. Mm, oh, no, hang on. This, yesterday, I got a an art psychotherapist, oh, uh, you know, inquiring. That's a bit it's a, it's a psychotherapist. You can tell by just the name of that. That's high value. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for that stuff, right? So I'd go with that one. It's just weird, man. I'm like, uh, you're a what? I'm a psychotherapist. Yeah, but only with art. Like, excuse me? <laughs> what yes, is it? I use I use art to heal my patients' minds. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, painting using elephant dung and things like that. Yeah, I'm like, uh, so does your patient need to be an artist before I can come to you? So you basically looking for nutty artists <laughs> to help <laughs> heal. <laughs> They're all nutty. Uh, <laughs> bad selection. I mean, artists aren't, well, I mean, the successful ones, one, successful ones are rich, but many aspiring artists aren't. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, so I was like, uh, okay, how am I attracting these clients? <laughs> oh, through your GMB listing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's, um, will we move on to number uh, 10? Okay, let's do that. Does Google care about internal links opening in a new tab? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, <sighs> I don't think so, but from a user's point of view, I think you need to think about it. Um, personally, if 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 a person clicks on the link within the site, they expect um, you know that page to open uh, on that site. Uh, if it's, it could get you know depending on the kind of site. If somebody's going to be clicking on a few different things, you know, products or. Uh, a different size product or uh, whatever, um, it's going to be a problem, you know, like the user, especially if he's on mobile, you know, uh, opening up new windows all the time on mobile is, is a bit of a hassle. Some phones don't handle it very well. Um, so, yeah, just be aware of that. Uh, personally, I probably have it open in the same window. Um, the only time that I would use sort of open a new window is if I'm referencing an external something or other. Um, and I don't want the user to have my window closed down. The other thing, I suppose, if it's desktop, mainly only desktop, um, all the traffic is really desktop. Uh, and for some reason, you've created some weird kind of site um, that you, some sites don't have a freaking back button. <laughs> so you do it from a get out of like, get around that kind of weird design floor. Um, you could, that could, that could be a reason for it. But apart from that, I would normally say open up in that, in, 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 in that actual window. Yeah, that actually, um, raises a question in my mind. Um, what happens in an in-app browser? You know, if you have 
a page opening in a new window, what's going to happen? I mean, on a browser, you know, on a mobile browser, it will open a new window, a new tab. But what happens in an in-app browser? No idea. You just have to test it. Hmm. Either opens in the current window, or it, or it actually spawns out a window in your, in whatever your browser is. Yeah. That's what I guess it does. Yeah, then then that's a pretty bad user experience, isn't it? Well, it, you know that. Well, mm. yeah, that would be. I most likely it opens in the current window. I'd I'd I'd. That's my best guess. Or it yeah. could spawn another window, which isn't a tabbed window, obviously, but another window in the app browser. You know, another instance of the app browser. I'm not sure. We're testing. You know what? I'm going to make an admission on this one, and I put it in a comment. I've always had, I have no evidence to back it up. I've always had a sneaky suspicion that this could be the tiniest of ranking factors of, you know, as in the equity that's passed across a link. And I can't tell you why. It's just always been a gut feeling that it's something that's so obvious. And I've always had this, just this suspicion that Google could look at this and say, well, actually those two links aren't like a link that opens in the current window versus one that spawns another window or a tab or whatever it is, that they're slightly different. Now, I'm not suggesting that it will be in any way like sort of like significant enough to make a difference in ranking, but I've always just had this suspicion that they they can easily see that that people are saying this link opens in another window as opposed to being in the current window. And just for some reason, I've always thought that they could be treated slightly, slightly differently. No evidence, but just a, a feeling. Could be completely wrong. Who knows? Would I change what I do? Absolutely not. But I just have this suspicion in me that they could be viewed slightly differently. There, I've, I've got it off my chest. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, yeah, I'm really tired, you know, I feel lighter. No, it, it, yeah, no, I agree with Richard. I've always, I've always had some kind of like a thing in the back of my mind about it, but yeah. Untestable, you know, there'd be no, uh, the only people who would ever know whether it would be any sort of factor would be obviously the people in the background who would have programmed it. So who knows? We'll never know. Okay. All right, let's um, wrap this one and let's uh, go to Sean Clark asked the question. Um, it's titled crawl budget can be a real concern. Um, Sean went on to say, uh, he said, we've been told by our new SEO consultant that to save on crawl budget, um, we should make a lot of our internal links uncrawlable. It's a pet hate of mine, Richard. Um, he said, we have a WooCommerce site um, with about 300 products. And every product has two to three uh, internal links, uh, plus links in the footer. And this is resulting in uh, the Search Console uh, seeing 47,000 uh, internal links. Um, he says that we should make these uh, links uh, uncrawlable. Is this a good idea? And if it is, how do I go about this? Um, Thanks. Um, anyone want to answer this? Uh, you can only answer if you're going to say that uh, it is not a good idea. <laughs> you know, my run list, for whatever reason on this question, it's it seems to be redirecting me to some sort of weird and wonderful... Don't ask me why. Moline, Molino glass bongs I'm getting redirected to on the run list. Anyone else? No, just me. Actually, I think you're right. Um, and, and Sean Clark, um, I'm fairly sure um, uh, he's got got um, a, a glass 
um, like they like melt glass and stuff like that. There's something obviously in this question that's I just get redirected. And it just says Facebook is a link in the top left. I've got a I've got a blank screen. It's 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 odd. By the way, this guy, in fairness to him, he sent me a private message uh, just to say thank you for commenting on his thread, which was decent of him, you know, to reach out and say thank you. Um, this, you know, I think I put in my answer, like, there's definitely a gap here between, either between the SEO's ears or between the SEO and the client in terms of communication, or it could be like the client as well. It's just misunderstanding what's been said, but... Like there's so many weird, odd, odd things in this question. Like, it's to remove links. It's not to remove URLs, and it's it's all over the place. But I can say hand and heart, if you've got 300 products, and if your site isn't a complete balls up, there's absolutely no way in hell that having lots of links on your site is going to do you any harm. Okay, if they're just all internal links, there is no way unless it's a complete balls up and you've got like 300 different URLs for every product, okay? And even then you're at 90,000 URLs and Google will crawl that in a day. If, you're, if your server is fast enough, they'll crawl. Assuming they'd want to crawl them, they'll crawl them in a day, no problem. The, there's no way that any SEO who says that a 300 product page needs to remove internal links because of crawl budget, there, there's definitely something absolutely completely bizarrely wrong in what they're telling you so it's either you're not they're not communicating right they don't have a clue or you're not listening or you're misinterpreting what they're telling you there's something completely wrong in this yeah yeah i mean yeah forty-seven thousand internal links in it that doesn't sound much yeah, let's be honest about it. A hundred per page, three hundred products, plus all your all your archive pages, your home page, your utility page. Every page has got nav links in it. Very normal for a page to have a hundred links on it. Like if it's a navigational type of page, like okay, the product. It depends really on how big his nav is, but like it doesn't sound at all excessive to me. If you divide that by three hundred products plus. Let's just say for the sake of argument, he's got another 30 pages, which are utility pages, which could be archives or contact us about us, privacy mm -hmm. policy. Like, it's not a whole lot of links per page. It doesn't sound outrageous to me in the least. You know, it, it, it just, just doesn't stack up. And, and there is no way, crawl budget is not based on links. Like, if, there, if there's only... Like those 47,000 internal links aren't unique links. They're internal links that are found across all the pages. Page A links to page B, that's a link. Well, th that link could be on all 300 pages. That's, that's reported as 300 internal links, not one. So, exactly. so like 47,000 internal links is nothing. And links are not a problem for Google to crawl, even if they were all unique links in some way, which is impossible unless the site is ballsed up, as I said. But even if it was ballsed up, the, the fix there is not to make those internal links not available. The fix is obviously to fix, is to is to stop what is out putting them on the pages from doing what it's doing. Like, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. And uh, my best guess is, and it hate, like I hate myself for saying it, my best guess is the guy who's given the advice is clueless. That's a bit yeah. hard, that's my best guess. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting if he has access to the um, search console to go and see how many pages are indexed under the coverage section and then look at the links section. I think that would clear things up in terms of number of pages that Google is crawling versus the number of links that it has detected um, within the site. And also the excluded pages in the in the coverage report would give a very good indication of stuff that that may be problematic, and that would show you pretty instantly pages which are non-canonical, which Google is canonicalizing. Like if you've got duplicate content, because your URL structures are all balls up. But I mean, it's you know the fix is something different. It's not the number of internal links that's causing that problem. It's not the volume. It's that the internal links themselves are are butchered. So yeah, it just. But look, 
you know, if he didn't pay for this advice, let's just say, let's say he got a, you know, off the cuff advice or someone pitching him in some way, well, look, you get what you pay for. But I, I don't know. I just hope he doesn't take any advice from someone who's telling him that having too many internal links is is a is a problem <laughs> with your crawl budget because that's just two more unrelated factors I cannot think of. Yeah, the thing is, um, he's a friend of yours now because he's sent you an email thanking you for your uh, participation. I, I, I was just wondering if we could get a bet on, you know, because I, I reckon that um, if he starts uh, um, no, no indexing pages and, and blocking crawl, um, that um, his traffic will go down and his sales will go down as a consequence. It's just great that he's reached out, that he's asked the question, that he hasn't trusted this. Because I think a lot of people probably do get caught by trusting and getting bad advice. We all know. We've all probably worked on, on sites where it's a cleanup exercise because someone has butchered their site. Like, it happens so often. You know, it's it's so it, it's great to see that he's reached out and that he's trying to do some research to, to qualify the advice thus far that he's, he's received. And, and, you know, it's clear that the advice is... Like I say, just wherever that wherever things are broken down, we just know that what he's telling us here is just complete bollocks. You know, it's complete bollocks. So it's good to see that he's reached out and that he's not going to let somebody go in and butcher his site. Hopefully, that's 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 the way I look at it. Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, let's go to number twelve. I think that's our. Uh, Largest one. Um, this is not really um, uh, well. Anyway, uh, it, it's from Kevin Carney. Uh, he, he's um, I, making a. a, a it's, it's titled John Mueller. Um, digital PR is not a spammy link building. So I'm curious what other people think about John Mueller's comment the other day about digital PR not being spammy link building. Um, and it links to an article that Google's John Mueller paid praises uh, digital PR in Search Engine Journal. Well, um, yeah, I don't know what to say. Um, Poor old John, eh? You know, I haven't met John in, a, in quite a few years now, but obviously I'd met him a lot in, you know, in times gone by. But like a more sort of unassuming person and a more, you know, someone who 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 really doesn't want any spotlight on him, you, would, you couldn't find somebody more than John who fits into that sort of persona. Like I'm sure he hates the fact that people are sort of talking like this, you know, going, oh, what he said about PR, digital PR, and it, it becomes a story in itself that he said something. I imagine maybe he's changed over the years. Who knows? But I imagine like he just hates this. You know, it's just not his thing. I think he's embraced it a little bit. If you've seen him, if you've seen him probably over the last year on Twitter, you can oh, see. Yeah. But he's trolling. Can, he's trolling. You, you can see him trolling a little bit and yeah. stoking oh. and stoking it when he has. You can see like days where he's on a roll, and you're like, "Ah!" Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they all they, you, like the gang of them. They they like to troll a bit, you know. But they just get. I, you can see that like there's there's a tiredness in them as well. Sometimes with with the fact that people take everything they say, and it sort of becomes a story, you know. There's spin put on it. Not everyone, but you can see there are people who are just spinning anything they say or anything that that doesn't agree with what they said previously and it mu like it must be a like a fierce hard job just day to day to deal with the same stuff and yet then he still goes out though and he answers those questions the same questions that are really basic like you do see him very often like especially on twitter you'll see him answering people who ask him you know who who have direct direct questions to him and it's it's basic stuff so like you can see he still takes the time and of course you see on like New Year's Day, is it New Year's Day or is it Christmas Day that he he still he goes out and he helps people every year? So yeah, I mean, it's so nice to see that. But God, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to swap jobs with him. That's for sure. Mm 
Yep. All right. Now, when, when we click this button, I think, yes, it is. It's that time again. We've answered uh, all of the questions uh, asked on the uh, Don Messier Questions uh, Facebook group um, for another week. And we'll be back uh, in another week's time uh, to do this uh, all again. Uh, before we go, I, I'd like to thank um, uh, Richard Hearn. Um, Richard um, um, was kind enough to, to step in tonight because we thought Tim Kappa was dead. And... Um, <laughs> I nearly was, mate. I nearly was. <laughs> Uh, don't die on me, Tim. Um, <laughs> and um, I must thank uh, Tim Kappa for you know pulling himself out of his deathbed and uh, getting in front of the camera. Um, David Razan down there in West Sussex, um, and uh, Masataki uh, in Wimbledon. Um, where, where are you? You're in Thailand, Richard, tonight? Yeah. And um, I must thank people like Rob Watts and Michael Martinez, people who answer questions uh, on, on our uh, um, Facebook group uh, through the week. Um, all right. Let me see. We can close this off. Let's see if I can figure it out. 